Uh, my name is Matt Beck. Uh, I am a dietitian at the uh, Norman Fixel Institute for Neurological Diseases. Uh, I'm honored to be here today to talk with you about some practical strategies to improve your health, specifically through uh, different uh, nutritional avenues. So while you read the objectives here, which are pretty straightforward, I just want to tell you a little bit about what a dietitian is and how it uh, may be different from a nutritionist. So a dietitian is someone who has gone through the formal education to provide medical nutrition therapy. Um, me personally, I've done a, a bachelor's degree in nutrition. I then did a master's in nutritional sciences, and now I'm doing a PhD in nutritional sciences. So uh, I know a few things. Uh, now, a nutritionist is not a protected title. So if you're talking to someone who's calling themselves a nutritionist, you might want to dig a little deeper, see what their credentials actually are. You know, there's, there's uh, basically very short certifications you can get online and then you can call yourself a nutritionist. So just be careful who you're talking uh, to about uh, nutrition as it relates to neurological diseases. And so these objectives here, what I want to do today is really talk about some of the most common uh, symptoms of PSP, CBS, and MSA um, and how they relate to your nutrition, your nutritional health. I also want to talk about what we can do to combat those symptoms, and then also tell you a little bit about uh, my general diet recommendations. So, I like to ask this question, and I think I, I know what most of you think, but I still think it's an important question to ask. Does nutrition matter? I hope most of you in your head thought yes, of course. I have met people that do not answer that way. And so what I like to tell people, remind people of, is that nutrition isn't going to cure anything uh, unless it's a nutritional deficiency. Uh, but good nutrition makes everything better and poor nutrition can make everything worse. And so whether we're talking about mood or physical strength or gastrointestinal symptoms, these can all be related to what you're eating and your diet. And so if we optimize the diet, that can just make you feel better across the board. Okay, so getting into the common nutrition relevant symptoms of these neurological conditions. What we're gonna to touch on today, swallowing difficulties. That's a big one. Uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, specifically constipation and gastroparesis. Uh, unintentional weight loss, another one that we dietitians watch out for very closely. And then kind of related to all of this, uh, are be the behavioral changes of some of these conditions that can affect your desire to eat. Okay, let's talk about problem swallowing first. So, uh, difficulty swallowing, also called dysphagia, dys meaning abnormal, phagia relating to eating, and in this case, swallowing. Uh, this is common across many neurological diseases and conditions, and it kind of ranges how much it affects a, a person. It can make eating just a little bit more difficult. You really don't have to change your diet very much, or it can possibly make eating and drinking unsafe um, due to risk of aspiration. Food material getting into the airway can cause infection and, and really be complicating. And so how do we as dietitians manage this with our patients? So first and foremost, pretty, pretty simple recommendation right off the bat. We want to avo avoid the certain foods that give you difficulty swallowing. So oftentimes these are hard foods, dry foods, tough foods like meat. Um, crackers, cereals, breads, things like that. Again, we might need to modify them a little bit. So the way that we can modify some of these foods to make them a little safer or easier to eat are by in, uh, preparing them in certain ways. Who's heard of sous vide? Okay, a couple people. So sous vide is a way of uh, cooking, uh, typically meats. Most people uh, use sous vide to, uh, to cook meats, but basically you put it in a food safe bag, seal it up, and put it in a pot of water. And there's a device that you clip onto the side of the pot that goes into the water and heats it to a very uh, specific temperature. This cooks the food while you seal in all the moisture, all the flavor, all the juices. And so once that's done cooking, you open up that bag, put it on the plate, and it just falls apart. It's extremely soft and delicious. You don't even really even need to season it. And so sous vide is a great option. The devices that you need to clip onto the pots are pretty inexpensive. You can buy them on Amazon. So that's something that you can think of. We also want to think about what can we add to food to make it go down easier. 
So condiments can often lubricate our food uh, so that, again, they, they're easier to swallow, easier to get down. So things like dressings, um, uh, gravies, uh, mayonnaise, ketchup, things like that, we can always add that to foods where appropriate uh, to get that food to go down a little easier. We can also very simply just reduce the chewing requirement. Uh, if we can chop or mince or process or even blend the food so that we don't have to do all of that ourselves in our mouth, um, that can also make it easier uh, for us to swallow. And we can also thicken liquids. This isn't the, the most popular thing. I'm not sure if I've met anyone who likes to thicken their liquids, but it is necessary for some people. Uh, there's different textures or different thicknesses of liquids that we can make with products that you can buy at your grocery store or the drugstore. Uh, one product is called Thicket. Uh, but we can make liquids that are very thin, slightly thicker, to a nectar, honey, or pudding consistency. That's a great thing to have as an option if uh, drinking thin liquids can be a little dangerous. Now, one thing as it relates to swallowing that I really like to highlight um, is enteral nutrition. So this is sometimes an uncomfortable subject to talk about, but out of every nutrition therapy at my disposal as a dietitian, over the years, uh, over the years, enteral nutrition is actually the most impactful thing I have ever seen on any of my patients who have gotten it. So enteral nutrition is nutrition delivered straight to the gut. We also call this tube feeding sometimes. Now in this case, I'm not necessarily talking about nasogastric tubes, so a tube that's outside of the body that goes up your nose, down the back of your throat, and in your stomach. What I'm talking about, you can see there on the, on the screen, basically a small incision is made and there's a tube that is put into the stomach and it comes right out of the abdomen. And this allows us to administer different formulas or, or blended food directly into the gut. And so if you're someone or your family member is someone who um, has a very, very hard time swallowing, or if it just is really, really difficult to eat, maybe the motor symptoms are, are very, very, make it very difficult to bring food to the mouth, um, this is often something that I, I really encourage my patients to think about. The effect on quality of life is incredible. Uh, it reduces the burden on uh, the person with a neurological disease. It also reduces the burden on the family. So definitely want to encourage folks to really consider this if it's an appropriate therapy uh, for you or your family member. And of course, enteronutrition wouldn't be something that I recommend unless it was an avenue to supply some really good nutrition. And so oftentimes what we use is enteral formulas, or you might have seen you know, some of these Ensure Boost products on the shelf at the grocery store or uh, drugstore or anything like that, but there's a lot of different types of formulas to address diverse nutritional needs. So there's some very high calorie formulas, there's some very high protein formulas, uh, there's lower fiber formulas, and there's non-dairy formulas for those who can't really tolerate too much dairy very well. They have gastrointestinal symptoms with too much dairy. Uh, you can also, um, of course, as I mentioned, uh, put homemade products through the tube oftentimes as well, as long as it's big enough. Uh, and so many times people choose to prepare their own food at home, they cook it up, they put it in a blender or process it appropriately to be put through that tube. So again, just wanna highlight enteral nutrition is something that I, I really encourage folks who, uh, who have that option or need to consider that option. Okay, some gastrointestinal symptoms that are um, very relevant uh, to our patients. First one I like to talk about is constipation. I always say this is a weird thing to say, but constipation is kind of my specialty. That's what my research is around. Um, so constipation is more than just infrequent bowel movements. Um, I think that's what most people think of when they think of constipation. Oh, I'm just not having a bowel movement. I'm constipated. Well, maybe, but also maybe not. So constipation, beyond infrequent bowel movements, is also straining. If you have to strain to have a bowel movement most times. If the bowel movements don't feel complete and satisfying, that's also a metric for constipation. Um, if the stool comes out as little pebbles or rocks, that's also a metric for constipation. And so you could be having a bowel movement every day and still technically be constipated. And so we really do want to play close attention to our bowel habits um, 
so that we can address this nutritionally or with a gastroenterologist. Uh, so, of course, constipation can be caused by uh, inadequate amounts of different types of fiber in the diet, certain medications, or a disease itself. Now, if we can attack constipation, it oftentimes significantly improves a person's quality of life. Uh, they're kind of freed from the laxatives or stool softeners that they have to take, uh, which could affect how much they can do in a day. If you're kind of worried about you know, having an urgent need to use the restroom, you might not go out and participate in social activities as much. And so with constipation, from a nutrition perspective, it requires the balancing of different fibers. So oftentimes fiber is talked about as one thing or a few different things. Often it's soluble versus insoluble fiber. And while I could, I won't get into it today, but really what we're talking about is viscosity of the stool. How hard or dry is it? So there are certain fibers that really help to move the stool through the gastrointestinal tract at a more normal rate. A lot of times people get constipated and start eating salads. That oftentimes really isn't going to help that much. Maybe it does. Maybe depending on the rest of your diet it does. But oftentimes, believe it or not, I've given you a little hint here on the screen, it's fruit that's most helpful, especially kiwi and berries. Blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, and straw strawberries. Believe it or not, we actually recommend people consume about three cups of fruit a day. Average American, less than one. Most people get it from juice. So really, really do encourage you to um, keep that fruit in the diet regardless of uh, whether or not you have constipation. But if you do have constipation symptoms, getting some fruit in the diet might be something uh, that can help. Uh, if you're struggling to get that two or three cups of, of fruit in the diet a day, I really do recommend smoothies. You can very easily fit a lot of fruit uh, into a small volume by blending it up and drinking it that way. Now, gastroparesis is another one that's fairly common. Gastroparesis describes the stomach not releasing its contents into the rest of the bowel as quickly as it should. So your, your stomach is connected to your small intestines and it should release a certain amount after, you know, over a certain amount of time. And for some reason, it's just not doing that. It's not letting that food into the small intestines. And that can make you feel bloated. That can cause abdominal pain, gas, and it can definitely reduce your appetite. If you feel bloated or uncomfortable after eating a meal, you might not eat as much. And so the way that we address this from a nutrition standpoint is really avoiding high fat meals and high fiber meals. Now, make no mistake, I'm not saying that you need to completely avoid these. A lot of my patients, they make that mistake. They think that, oh, I can't have fat because I have gastroparesis, or I shouldn't eat fiber because I have gastroparesis. That's not the case. You just don't want to eat, say, a big old piece of fried chicken. Very fatty, right? I know I'm breaking somebody's heart out there right now. But, um, you know, again, we, we want to manage the amount of fat that we have at any amount of time. Same thing with fiber. Again, if you have gastroparesis specifically, uh, you probably wouldn't want to have a big old salad for dinner, something like that. You could have a little bit of veggies with some protein and some starch, that's fine. But again, we don't want to overdo it with these because this all affects how quickly the stomach empties. Okay, unintentional weight loss. As I mentioned before, this is a big red flag that we are always checking. Uh, in our patient's charts for. So unintentional weight loss can be caused by a lot of different things. Uh, there are metabolic changes in a lot of neurological diseases and conditions, uh, and that can affect how many calories you burn in a day. Maybe you burn, burn more, maybe you burn less. There was a study that I think came out last year on uh, people with PSP. Uh, it's actually found that uh, within the first couple years of diagnosis, their metabolism actually decreases, and that's because of the loss of muscle and fat-free mass or organ uh, muscle that they have. Their uh, unintentional weight loss can also be related to changes in nutritional intake, like we were just talking about. If you have problems swallowing or if you have gastrointestinal symptoms that are affecting your appetite, you might not eat as much, and that can cause you to lose weight. Um, also, we talked about decompensation uh, in a couple of the talks beforehand. So if you're not moving as much, um, you're not using your muscles, you could be losing it. And that's what we really want to uh, prevent uh, more than anything else, the loss of muscle. And so unintentional weight loss in and of itself isn't extremely worrying unless there's a lot of weight lost 
uh, over a short or long period of time, but unintentional weight loss can lead to malnutrition. Uh, malnutrition complicates everything. So it can make your symptoms worse, uh, you'll feel weaker. There's uh, some research to suggest that it also affects cog uh, cognition, uh, obviously blood pressure, and of course, diminished quality of life. And so what do we as dietitians recommend for this? Well, this is kind of when you get a free pass from me. I kind of tell you, eat anything you want. Now, I don't want you living off of ho-hos and ice cream. That's what I tell everybody, don't, don't do that. But you want to keep those as tools in the toolbox and have them you know, occasionally, that's perfectly fine. So the main priority here is preventing further unintentional weight loss. So you might want to lose weight and you might experience the weight loss and you didn't intend to lose it and it might be welcome. And that might not be a red flag for us after we talk, but the problem is it's going to continue if you don't do something about it. And so we want to prevent further weight loss, further unintentional weight loss, and we do that with a high calorie, high protein diet. The calories give your body the energy that it needs to do the chemical reactions that occur in your body, and the protein preserves your muscle, preserves your strength, preserves your balance. And so there are some high calorie foods that provide a lot of energy in a small volume uh, that um, we want to emphasize. And so these are things like butter and honey and oils and dressings, nut butter, uh, whole milk, you know, not the non-fat stuff, yogurts, baked goods, smoothies and milkshakes, as I mentioned before, great way to get a lot in a small volume. High protein foods, uh, foods like I said, preserve muscle mass. So these are things like fish and poultry, red meat dairy, eggs, beans, peas, and lentils. Don't forget about those, beans and peas and lentils. Very high plant-based protein. Uh, and nut butters again, tofu, cheeses, all a good or great source of protein. And so we wanna get these in the diet uh, as often as we can if we have someone who is unintentionally losing weight. Okay, so sometimes you get kind of a symptom storm. That's why I have the, the storm on the slide there. So you get more than one thing happening at a time. Uh, and this often um, makes treating uh, these symptoms a little bit more complicated. And so for instance, if you have gastroparesis and constipation, um, well, that's tough, right? Because the stomach isn't emptying as quickly, but you need a certain type of fiber to help the constipation or you know, let's say you have a swallowing problem and there's a lot of unintentional weight loss, how do we address this? And so you have to work with your clinical team to effectively manage these nutrition relevant symptoms at the same time. Now, some of you might have none of those problems. You might be thinking, Matt, um, I can swallow fine. I don't have any GI symptoms or I'm not losing weight. Honestly, I could lo lose a little bit of weight. Uh, well, I want to talk about the diet that we recommend for neurological health at a baseline. Um, this is something that I recommend pretty much everybody try to emulate, whether you're uh, someone with a neurological condition or you're a family member or a friend. This will keep you as healthy as you can be for the longest time. This is the diet that I recommend to 99.9% .9 of humans. Um, that 0.1% that isn't included there have errors of uh, inborn errors of metabolism and so you have to be uh, very special with their diet. So this is the diet that I recommend to most folks. And so it is a Mediterranean diet. I'm sure you've probably heard of the Mediterranean diet before, but these are the recommendations that specifically come from the scientific literature. So the Mediterranean diet doesn't necessarily mean that you have to eat foods only of the Mediterranean region. Uh, you're not pigeonholed into only eating French food or Palestinian food or Northern African food. Uh, you can take any cuisine and make it Mediterranean in nature. And so these are the things that we really want to emphasize in a Mediterranean diet. These are the things on the screen that we want the most of. Fruit, especially those deep blue and red berries. Veggies, and not just the starchy ones, not just potatoes and corn and green beans. We want those whole grains, so the breads and the pastas and the rices that still have their fiber. That fiber nourishes the gut microbiome, the bacteria that live in your gastrointestinal tract, which does have an, uh, a significant effect on neurological health. Pulses. Pulses are beans and peas and lentils. They're the seeds of legumes. We really like those because of their protein, as I mentioned, as well as their fiber and carbohydrate content. 
Nuts and seeds have a little bit of protein, I think less than most people think, uh, but they also have a very, very healthy fat. Those omega-3 fatty acids that we're uh, always talking about with fish, they're also in nuts and seeds in a little different form, but we still wanna uh, emphasize those. And of course, the basis of all of our meals should be extra virgin olive oil. We actually recommend a fair bit of olive oil, uh, olive oil about four tablespoons a day. You don't have to get out your shot glasses though and start knocking it back. Just be heavy handed with it when you cook. Okay, the Mediterranean diet uh, continued here. Moderate consumption. What things do we want in the diet but we don't necessarily need to overemphasize? So we like fatty fish. It's a great source of protein. There's a, a very healthy anti-inflammatory fat in there. There's omega-3s, EPA, and DHA. We really want that in the diet uh, at least three times a week. So this includes tuna, mackerel, sarin, uh, salmon, herring, sardines. There's some other fatty fish too, if none of those are uh, super intriguing to you. So things like black cod, cobia. Mahi-mahi is even fairly fatty. It's not the fattiest fish out there, but still something that you can work into the diet. Uh, for uh, fermented dairy products, so yogurts and cheeses, they have their place. They're not emphasized, but you know they can be a side or they can be part of breakfast. Eggs, we don't uh, encourage uh, a ton of eggs, but if you like eggs, you can eat them. I typically recommend six to eight eggs a week, perfectly fine. If you're getting to a dozen eggs a week or more, I start to wonder, are you getting all the fruit? Are you getting all the veggies in the diet? Are you getting all the other stuff that we want to emphasize more strongly? Um, than, than those eggs in there, or is eggs your main source of protein. Poultry, so your white meats, chicken, and turkey. Uh, again, that's what we recommend when you're not having the fatty fish. And then if you drink alcohol, we do um, say it's okay to drink wine with meals. And so there's not really a nutritive effect to wine. Yes, it does have antioxidants in there, but I'm sure you've heard this a number of years ago now. They they found out that you had to drink like 100 or 120 bottles of red wine to have any physiologic effect, and your, your body's gonna make you stop before you get close to 120 bottles. Now, what do we want to de-emphasize? What do we not want a lot of in the diet? So, these are things like red and processed meats, beef and pork products across the board, including bacon and sausage and things like that, and also refined sugars. Okay, so again, it's not that you can't have these foods. There's no food that's so bad for you that you can never eat it. We just don't wanna have these foods all the time. So if you want a nice cut of steak a couple times a week, date night, perfectly fine. You wanna have a little bit of chocolate, you wanna have a little bowl of ice cream, you wanna have a little ho-ho you know, ho -ho here or there, that's fine, but we wanna make it kind of special. We wanna look forward to it. We want to really enjoy it when we have it so that we can honor that dish and it doesn't become something that's just run of the mill. I tell everybody this, once a year on my birthday, I make myself a angel food cake from scratch. Um, special time of year, I like to do it. If I did that every day, angel food cake would mean nothing to me when my birthday rolled around. Uh, and so it's, it's about honoring those treats that you really, really like. Okay, and so on the screen here is kind of an all-in-one here. This is uh, the amounts of everything that we recommend. So we really do encourage people to only use olive oil. Um, like I said before, about four tablespoons a day. Uh, we recommend at least two servings of veggies a day. Okay, so if we're talking about cooked versus raw veggies, the quantity will differ, but generally cooked veggies, a serving is about a cup. And you really wanna uh, get a good um, variety of veggies as well. Like I mentioned before, you don't want to only eat starchy veggies. I typically recommend people consume 10 to 15 different veggies in their diet each week. So again, you can have the starchy stuff. You can have potatoes and corn and green beans, but you also want to get the broccoli and cauliflower and carrots and bell peppers and asparagus and Brussels sprouts and cabbage and lettuce and radicchio, et cetera, et cetera, as much as you can. Uh, we already talked about this, fruit. Try to get three cups of fruit a day. Um, we like to recommend that people eat those beans and peas and lentils at least three times a week. Uh, fatty fish, three times a week as well. Uh, once again, nuts and seeds, especially walnuts, hazelnuts, almonds, and peanuts, at least three times a week. Now a word about nuts and seeds, they are healthy, a little bit of protein, a lot of healthy fat, very easy to overeat. 
So be careful. Get your small handful. I'll be honest. A serving of nuts is kind of unsatisfying. But get your small handful, seal up that bag, and put it away. Don't sit and you know eat the bag in front of the computer or the TV because you're going to lose track. And before you know it, you're going to eat 1,400 you know, calories of just pistachios. I've done it. I'll admit it. Um, OK. And as we were mentioning, fish is kind of the best. That's what we want the most of in the diet. But the rest of the week, when you're not eating fish, we do want to have that white meat uh, more often than the red meat. And then we like to make this base called sofrito. Um, if you know what it is, it's actually uh, very similar to a basic red spaghetti sauce. And so it's a little bit of onion or a little bit of garlic in the pan with some olive oil, add some tomatoes to it. And the reason why we recommend people include this in their diet is because it's a great vehicle for a lot of other healthy foods. So you can throw veggies into that, you can throw fish into that, and again, kind of start building a delicious, healthy meal with just that base. And then as I mentioned before, we wanna save the red meat, the soda, the pastries, the ice cream, and things like that for you know a couple times a week at the most. Again, I want you to enjoy the foods that you like. We just don't wanna do those ones that we know aren't super healthy every day. And so I'll be sticking around after the conference. If you have specific questions about nutrition or supplements, happy to help. But thank you so much. It was an honor, honor to be here today.